believe in uh, running the trains on time, so it is now 2 o'clock and uh, we shall begin the conference. <clears throat> My name is Adam Mossoff. I'm co-founder uh, along with uh, Mark Schultz of the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property, and we are both directors of academic programs and senior scholars at the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property, uh, which we just go by e more easily by the nick acronym CPIP. And welcome to CPIP's third annual conference, the IP Platform Supporting Invention and Inspiration. Now, a platform for innovation and creativity is a concept that's been popularized in recent years by the high-tech revolution. Um, people may not have really under heard this concept before, but people have become aware of it in recent years through things like the World Wide Web or the iPhone and Android operating systems where they understand that there are things that are built upon other things. But the concept applies broadly to all of the foundational technologies or artistic creations that serve as the basis for follow-on innovation and creative work. The concept of a platform for innovation and creativity is even broader than just technology or art. The law, the law also serves as a platform for innovation and creativity by securing the fruits of productive labors of the inventors, artists, and business persons. The intellectual property system, IP, and by this we mean the various rights that secure new values in inventions, art, business methods, and commercial goodwill is itself a platform for innovation and creativity. Now unfortunately, the legal and policy debates about IP rights tend to occur in silos. Legislation and court cases, for instance, focus entirely on legal or policy issues within the narrow boundaries of a particular doctrine, patent, copyright, trademark, or trade secret. But inventors, artists, business persons, and lawyers know that this is an overly restrictive and narrow conception of how the IP system actually functions in promoting the creation of new inventions and creative works and in making possible the distribution of these new products and services throughout the world. The company that relies on a patent to protect its new invention also relies on copyright to protect its documents, such as a user manual or ad copy. It also relies on trademark to make possible its advertising and the recognition of its product or service by consumers. Well-known names like Theraflu or the iPhone. This company also relies on trade secret for the manufacturing processes or business methods that are not readily discernible or, or capable of being reverse engineered by consumers or competitors. The IP system is exactly that, a system that provides an integrated set of legal rights and protections that make possible the creation, development, and commercial distribution of the products and services that comprise a flourishing society and a an growing economy. The IP system is a platform for innovation and creativity. This conference thus pushes back against the silo effect that has occurred in the legal and policy debates, as well as in academic discussions about the IP system. Over the next two days, we will focus on the underexplored and rarely discussed point that IP rights provide an integrated set of protections for the wide-ranging creative and innovative steps that take something from an idea in someone's mind to the lab or the studio to the extensive development stages by companies and ultimately to retailers and banner ads on websites or Super Bowl commercials. At every step along the production and distribution chain, the IP system is there to facilitate the inventors, creators, manufacturers, retailers, and marketing professionals who are all necessary parts of the economic machinery in a flourishing innovation economy. The IP system is a platform for invention and inspiration. Thank you. Hello. As, as Adam said, my name is Mark Schultz. I'm co-founder of CPIP. And uh, I have I have uh, some some uh, very uh, some some very necessary uh, and welcome thank yous to, to give for this conference, as well as a few announcements. So first, we'd like to thank the Law Review. Uh, the George Mason Law Review is uh, has gone through incredible efforts to make this conference possible. Uh, we'd like to thank them in advance for publishing a conference issue of essays based on the panel discussions today and tomorrow. The Law Review's published conference issues for the last two CPIP annual conferences, copies of which are available at the front desk. 
along with other materials from CPIP scholars and sponsors of this conference. Several of our policy briefs and other publications are out there, so we encourage you to look at, uh, have a look at them. Uh, I'd also like to thank the 21 sponsors of this conference whose support for our mission in producing data-driven, rigorous scholarship about IP rights and how they function in the real world is very much appreciated. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience members. Uh, each year our community has grown, uh, the number of sponsors has grown, this is our third conference, and we have uh, more attendees than, than ever who will be coming throughout the next day and a half. So thank you. Um, and a couple of announcements. The, for audience members who are asking questions, you should know that the conference is being live streamed and recorded. So uh, while speakers have signed releases, we're just letting the audience know that if you're commenting, uh, you're consenting to have your comment end up on, on the audio of the stream or, or your, your questioning. Um, let's see, last uh, and not least, you can follow the conference on Twitter uh, by the hashtag, uh, I think we have it up here, so I don't have to recite it, uh, hashtag CPIP2015. Uh, so please, uh, please tweet using the hashtag. And finally, to keep current on our publications and activities, please sign up for the uh, email list on our website as well as follow CPIP on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Christina Pietro for uh, her hard work in organizing the logistics of this conference and uh, making Adam and my life much easier than it would otherwise <laughs> be. So thank you, Christina. And thank you, everyone, for, for attending. We'll begin now. Uh, with our first panel, Making Music, IP, and the Creative Process. So if our panelist and moderator can join us, thanks. So our first panel is entitled Making Music, IP, and the Creative Process. Uh, my name is Chris Newman. I teach here at George Mason, and I'm mostly going to just introduce our speakers. Their lengthy bios, are, I think, are, are in our conference materials, but we're just going to uh, introduce them briefly, and then we'll, uh, after we've heard from each of them, we'll, we'll try to have some uh, time for questions. So our first speaker, and by the way, for the speaker's benefit, Christina down there is going to be represent the ruthless shifting of the sands of time and hold up <laughs> warnings to you as to how much time you have left to speak. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Matthew Barblon, who is director of CPIP. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Barblon, and today I'll be talking about how copyright encourages and fosters artistic and creative freedom in the music industry. How copyright serves as a platform for artistic and creative freedom. And uh, to, to make this point, I'm gonna focus mainly on the relationship between copyright, economic freedom, and artistic freedom. And now some of you might be thinking to yourselves, wait a minute, artistic freedom isn't about economic freedom. It's, it's not about money. It's about being free to do exactly what you want to do with your art, even if that means copying someone else's art. And I think that's a really oversimplified way of looking at artistic freedom. And I think it fails to capture many of the factors that affect musicians' ability to create their music. And so I'll argue that when you're talking about the relationship between copyright and artistic freedom, it's important to consider the economic impacts of copyright, in, in particular, the economic freedom that copyright provides. And it's important to consider how that economic freedom impacts people's ability to live their lives as musicians, to, to pursue careers as professional musicians rather than just as amateurs, and to really dedicate their lives to their art. I'll also talk a bit about why I don't buy the argument that copyright just forces or pressures artists into creating a bunch of mainstream commercial music that doesn't satisfy their artistic vision and that isn't any good. Uh, to the contrary, 
I, I think that having a commercial marketplace for music increases artistic freedom and makes it easier for artists to find success while at the same time staying true to their artistic vision and making great music. So first off, uh, to talk about how copyright's economic freedom increases artistic and creative freedom, it's helpful to start by reviewing how copyright gives musicians economic freedom in the first place. And here's how it works. Copyright gives musicians a marketable property right to the fruits of their labor. That's kind of just a, a fancy way of saying that because of copyright, as a musician, you own the music that you create. And this could be the lyrics to a song that you wrote. It could be the guitar riff and chord progression that you wrote. It could be a piano concerto. The list goes on. But the point is that you own it. And it makes sense that you should own it because it's value that you've created. It's value that would not exist but for the effort that you put into making it. So because of copyright, from the outset, you've got this property right, and it gives you the freedom to decide the best way to capture the economic value of the music that you've created. The beauty of having a copyright and having a property right, having ownership, is that it gives you a lot of options. It gives you a lot of flexibility. You can capture value by recording your music and selling copies of the recording, by performing it publicly and selling tickets, by selling your copyright outright, by licensing it, and so on. You can work with a label or a publisher if you want to. You can go in on your own if you'd rather do that. And if you really want to, you're still allowed to just give it away. So the point is, copyright gives musicians the economic freedom to decide what business model they want to pursue. So why does this economic freedom matter for artistic and creative freedom? Well, for starters, it's helpful to understand that music isn't created in a vacuum. The economic circumstances that musicians find themselves in can have serious effects on how free they are to creatively express themselves through their music. And you know, as much as everybody loves the cliche of the starving artist, real musicians need food. They have, they got kids to put through college, they have mortgages to pay, they got doctors and dentist bills, just like everyone else. And if they can't make ends meet through their music, they're gonna find something else to spend most of their time on. Now, something important to keep in mind here, this isn't to say that the only reason people create music is for the money. And I'm sure if you, if you asked a bunch of musicians why they create their music, they wouldn't tell you it's for the money. They'd tell you that they're, they're passionate about it. They're expressing their emotions. They find meaning in it. They enjoy the creative outlet. Or maybe they just can't help but do it. But even if musicians aren't creating their music for the money, it's still important to understand and be realistic about what the money makes possible. And without the economic freedom to capture the value of what they create, to make money from their music, many musicians would find themselves limited in how free they really are to develop their music and reach their creative potential. One of the great things about copyright is that it supports a professional class of musicians. And this is something that's often lost in discussions about copyright. People, people focus on the fact that music would still exist without copyright, and that, that's certainly true. But without copyright, it would be much harder for musicians to actually make a living as professionals. And this has important implications for artistic and creative freedom. So having copyright and having a professional class of musicians gives many musicians the freedom to dedicate their lives to their music and their art in a way that simply isn't possible for amateurs. And it has a number of benefits for artistic and creative freedom. The, the first benefit is time. Making music can be really time consuming. And especially when music isn't just a hobby, but it's your livelihood, you have way more freedom to spend the time that you need to make your music what you really want it to be, to reach your creative potential. And you know, this doesn't mean that amateurs and hobbies can't create good music, but the fact of the matter is someone that's working a nine to five job outside of music is gonna have much less time to consistently create the kind of music that really satisfies their creative vision. It's especially true if You've got you know, other commitments in your life, like kids to take care of when you get home from work. The second great benefit that copyright provides to artistic freedom is resources. Music isn't cheap to create, and particularly the case for you know, high quality or large scale works. Well, while there are some musicians that are, you know, they can satisfy their creative vision by writing the song and posting it on YouTube, a lot of other musicians' creative vision involves several days of studio time. It involves hiring a producer, hiring studio musicians and backup singers, mixing costs, mastering costs, the list goes on. 
And, and by providing a marketable property right to these works, copyright gives musicians the freedom to find partners, like, like record labels, that can help them fulfill, fulfill their creative vision by giving them the resources they need, to, they need to create the music that they want to make. And as an added bonus, many of these projects end up being some of our favorite songs and albums. And even for the, the few musicians that already have these resources, that already have the money to pay for very you know, expensive works, uh, copyright gives them a chance to capture the value of that investment so that they can reinvest that into their artistic works in the future. Now, another great benefit of supporting a professional class of musicians instead of just amateurs is that it gives musicians way more freedom to develop the underlying skills that they incorporate into their art. And this means different things to different musicians. So you might have a, a jazz guitarist that's got to practice hours a day just to, just to keep his chops up so that he can play in a way that really satisfies his artistic vision. Uh, but it's not always just about technique or physical skill. You know, it's, it's easy to forget that songwriting and creative expression are also skills that take practice, that take nurturing. You know, for every song that you write, there might be 50 that you riffed on and then ultimately discarded. Professional musicians can afford to develop their skills here in a way that for most amateurs just simply isn't possible. Now at this point, a lot of people will say, great, that's fine, that's all fine and well, but that doesn't copyright really cut against artistic freedom because musicians are gonna feel pressure to make music that fits into the commercial marketplace that appeals to the lowest common denominator but that really isn't their artistic vision? What won't artists feel forced to make music that the record companies like instead of the music that they actually like? And as a result, don't we just end up with a bunch of mainstream commercial garbage? Now, I think the exact opposite is true. I think that having a healthy commercial marketplace for music makes it easier to be successful while staying true to your artistic vision. And I think it leads to a wide variety of great music. And, and this is really one of those areas where in my mind, the conventional wisdom does not match up with reality. Commercial market for music has several advantages for musicians in their creative freedom. First, it gives musicians the freedom to decide the best audience for them and to market their music to that audience. Now, this puts them in the same position as any other entrepreneur. If you want your work to be successful, you gotta find an audience to support it, but you have the freedom to figure out how you're gonna do that. Another great thing about having a healthy commercial marketplace for music is that it allows for, all audi for audiences of all shapes and sizes. You can have big audiences, small audiences, mainstream, niche, and so on. So the, the Scottish fiddler that your grandmother loves can market his music to one audience, and the punk rocker that your teenage kids love can market his music to another. And uh, you know, you got Marilyn Manson on one side fulfilling his audience, and, uh, and Faith Hill on the other marketing her music to her audience. And what you end up with is a music industry with a wide variety of genres, a wide variety of points of view, and with both mainstream and niche works that have enduring cultural and artistic value. And as an added bonus, the music is more likely to be culturally relevant because artists speak to the experiences and emotions that they share with their, with their audience. So uh, before I wrap up, I just wanna make two last points. First thing that's worth mentioning is that you only get the benefits of copyright here if you enforce it and if you don't water it down. So you could have the perfect copyright law on the books, but if infringement is widespread, if musicians' property rights aren't protected, you quickly lose all the benefits I just discussed. And you get a similar result if you start watering down the copyright, if you start watering down the property rights. And this, this could happen through exceptions to copyright that end up really swallowing the right, uh, or it can happen through excessive compulsory licensing regimes. And these are areas that we really struggle with these days and areas that need to be addressed if we wanna have a healthy music industry that supports artists' creative freedom. The second point I'll make is, I think it's important to remember that copyright is not free of limitations. And uh, this is obvious, copyright limits your ability to copy other people's work without their permission. And some people think this is a huge imposition on artistic and creative freedom. I disagree, and here's why. I think it's important to remember that freedom doesn't mean the absence of all limitations. Some limitations 
are going to be important in order to protect the freedom of others. And so when, when you're talking about which system does the best job of empowering musicians to create and empowering their artistic and creative freedom, it's important to, to compare copyright to other real world alternatives and to acknowledge the trade-offs that you're making if you weaken copyright. And when you start comparing to other models like, like the patronage model uh, or you know, the, the model that's really popular that people talk about right now, the, the lost leader model where musicians are encouraged to give away their music for free and make money off of uh, ancillary goods or live performances. When you, when you compare copyright to other models, I think it becomes obvious pretty quickly that copyright is the best platform we have for encouraging artistic and creative freedom. Uh, so just to conclude, you know, wrap this all up, when we're talking about how copyright affects artistic and creative freedom in the music industry, it's important to consider the economic circumstances of artists and how these economic circumstances affect their ability to create music that really satisfies their artistic vision. By giving artists economic freedom through a marketable property right to the music they create, by supporting a professional class of musicians, and by enabling a healthy commercial marketplace for music, I think copyright serves as a great platform for artistic and creative freedom. Thank you. <clears throat>
And the blue line there with number two is a diaphragm, and that's just a very thin piece of material that can move quite easily when sound waves hit it. The key with the diaphragm is it's attached to number three, which is simply a wire coil. Those of you who know basic electronics, you know that you can make motors, other sorts of things by inductive power where you have a fixed magnet and you have a coil wrapped around it. And then if you apply electricity, right, you can get that coil to move. In the reverse, if something physical is moving the coil, you can induce a very small but still a, dis a usable electrical signal. So that's what comes out five. Moving against number four, which is the permanent magnet. So that's how the microphone works. Once you do that now, you can put it into an amplification circuit, and then you go to a loudspeaker, which is just the microphone in reverse. What do I mean by that? Well, look down there, you'll see there's a magnet again, you'll see there's a coil, and then the diaphragm now is much bigger, and what's happening is you're sending the amplified, more powerful signal to that coil, and that's making the coil jump as against the magnet, and that's moving the diaphragm, and now making a much bigger sound. Okay, so those of you who know electronics, that was very basic, and you could probably explain it better than I did, but for those who don't understand it, does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay, good, thank you, great. Okay, so I told you the challenges. Another challenge with the microphone is that if I put this microphone now right in front of this guitar, if I put it too close, it'll start what they call feeding back, that awful squealing kind of sound. Because microphones, that's why you never put your hand over one. You've got to be very careful, which they're very sensitive. So that's not working. It's omnidirectional. So George Bouchon realizes, wait, most of these guitars these days have steel strings. Steel strings that are vibrating. Wait, if I put that in a magnetic field, it will also induce a current. So here is his patent for what's called the frying pan guitar. Why frying pan? Because it looks like a frying pan, in a way. And notice it has no acoustic resonant body, because he realizes you don't need one now. Why? Because you're not picking up sound waves anymore. Instead, what you're doing is you're picking up just the vibrations of metal strings. Now, why it's called uh, horseshoe is, see, am I, that's not illuminating so well. But what you see there is two big horseshoe magnets surrounding then another coil in there, and the strings are vibrating. You see those cool flux lines, and that's showing you that when the strings vibrate, they induce the sound. Okay, so that's his patent. Notice how early it is. It's in the 1930s. Okay? So he puts this thing out there, and that then enables people like Charlie Christian to put pickups onto regular acoustic guitars, okay? Now, other patents, it's not just in jazz and things like that, but this is an early patent for a lap steel guitar. So for country and western and other music forms, this starts becoming used as well. Okay. Bouchamp works with Adolf Rickenbacker. And any of you who play guitars know the Rickenbacker name, but look at the first name of their country, uh, company, Roe Patton. Electro patent instruments. So this was a whole futuristic kind of, I don't want to call it space age because it's too early for that, but this is, we're going to create all new kind of electronic instruments. This is not, you know, your old thing. They rename it to Electro String Instrument Corporation and later to Rickenbacker, and they make very famous electric basses and 12-string guitars later. Okay. Notice now what's happening is, let's move to the, hold on, next pickup. Okay. Notice on this pickup now, you lose the big horseshoe magnets because now they realize that you don't necessarily need the big horseshoe magnets. You can simply use the coil and the, see the metal pieces, there's six metal pieces going uh, straight up and down and those are corresponding to each of the strings, okay? Now, here's an interest, all this is happening in the 1930s. A problem though with these new electronic instruments is that it's a single coil, and that single coil then picks up not just the vibration of the metal strings, but also every other power source in the room. So what happens is you get tremendous buzz, hum, other unpleasant sounds that sometimes can overwhelm the sound of the guitar itself. And so this guy, Armand Noblau, working for Baldwin Piano Company, unfortunately piano, not guitar company, invents the first what's called humbucking pickups. So what does he do? He puts two coils next to each other. And then with the two coils wired in a certain way, they can cancel out between them the hum from the interfering sources, 
while letting the vibration of the metal string still pass through. Okay, so here's the schematics for it. And then I showed you this pattern a moment ago. The addition here, and then I'm going to start demonstrating all this for you, is that you can adjust those different pole pieces. Okay. Gibson then by the 1940s puts out a very famous pickup called the P90, but it's still a single coil. They're uh, uh, competing with Epiphone, okay? And then we get to Leo Fender. Leo Fender also in the 1940s and very early 50s. And what does he do? And now I'll start demonstrating this. He goes back to the idea of you don't need a box, a resonant box anymore. See, Charlie Christian and the early players still wanted a pickup put onto a resonant box because they felt more comfortable with it. It gave a warm sound, but it was not always as powerful. And so Fender says, let's just make a solid body. There you go. So you've seen this before. There's a Stratocaster, right? I've got kind of a crackly chord here. Well, that's loud. You can hear that now, right? But it doesn't sound like an acoustic guitar at all. It sounds like something completely different. So it takes a while. Remember, these things were invented in the 1930s. It takes till the 40s and really getting into the 50s for people to start saying, I think that's kind of a cool sound and I can work with that. Notice another weird thing about this guitar. See the bolts back there? The neck comes completely off this. So this is, that's always the opposite of a resonant box. It's simply a interchangeable parts thing that you bolt together. So everything is adjustable. You can take this whole plate out here with all the electronics. Again, you can take the neck off, okay? But what's really important that even though the early instrument manufacturers are trying to reproduce the sound of an acoustic. They end up with something that's very different. And one thing that's really important is what we call compression, in that I can now play very quiet passages that if I played them on the acoustic, wouldn't sound loud at all. I'd have to really bang the strings hard. And they come out fairly loud. So listen to this. It's a muting. If I were doing it on the acoustic, it would be quite soft. And then if I lay into it harder. It's louder, but it's not as loud as you might expect it to be. So this allows players to do a whole new kind of thing. First, they can do single notes that sound a lot better. Now notice how when I go to the chords, it's louder, but it's not crazy louder. As I'm laying into it, do you hear one other potential flaw, though? It's starting to break up a little bit. By break up, it's clipping. <clears throat> so tube circuits, because again, we're in the 1930s and 40s, there's no solid state amplification. And so this is, in fact, a tube amp. It's a newer one. But tubes, when you start driving them too much, they clip and compress more. But they clip and compress in a cool way. Solid state sounds awful when it clips. This sounds pretty good, if you like rock and roll. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't like that. I mean, I like that. But. All that sound, that crazy distorted sound, is coming from the tubes clipping. Okay? Now, here's another challenge, which is that if you had a microphone and you were trying to run it through that, it would just squeal uncontrollably because you would have all kinds of feedback. It's only because you're using then, see right here, here are those six poles, if you can see them on the guitar, okay? And those six poles then are you know, picking up the vibration of the metal strings. There's a coil underneath, there's the wire coil underneath this white part here. And that is where, that's the part that's attached to the jack. And so it's purely electromagnetic vibrations. And so you could just overdrive the bejesus out of it and do that. Okay, so this makes 
this instrument become extremely, what I call the Fender Revolution, takes over jazz, blues, rock, well, early rock, uh, country, all sorts of various. Now, notice one other thing, and then we're going to move to another key invention that happens. We're going to go back to the Baldwin Company, but kind of go forward, too. The placement of the pickup makes a huge difference in sound. So notice if I'm, I've done this switch here, and I'm on this, what's called the neck pickup, obviously, because it's near the neck, right? Gets a nice, warm, kind of bluesy, jazzy sound. Now if I go to the middle pickup, it's a very different kind of sound. It's a little more trebly, a little twangier. And then if I go all the way to the bridge pickup, and notice then we'll look through some of the patents again in a moment, most of the patents were having the pickup near the bridge. But that's the twangiest, not always the most usable sound. <laughs> So it's a good sound. Again, if you like that sound, notice the difference, all just coming from switching between the different pickups. Now notice also this pickup is angled because there was a realization that even small rotations of the pickup and where these poles are vis-a-vis -vis the strings makes a huge difference. And then the last Fender innovation that I'll talk about before switching to the very famous PAF pickup is that when you put combinations of these pickups together in the way that Fender, again, just sort of accidentally wired these guitars, these pickups are they're both on, but they're out of phase. It's a really kind of cool sound. I don't know how to describe the sound, but you hear that then getting really popular later in the 80s and the 90s. And here's another version where you put on these two pickups. Again, they're out of phase. Same riff, but hear how it sounds a little different. tones, again, coming about quite accidentally because we're simply trying to find a way to amplify an old chamber kind of background instrument, and we didn't have good enough technology that we have today, by the way, to make this sound like an acoustic. So if you notice, that guitar has a pickup in it. It's a very modern pickup, and if I plug that in, it would sound like an acoustic guitar. So in some ways, we have to thank early primitive tube and other kind of technology for giving us the rock and roll sound because we would have bypassed all this. This was in many ways the tube overdrive, all this stuff was kind of an accident. Okay, the last piece of the puzzle, because we only have about 15 minutes here to do this, is the hum was still a big problem. This is a modern Strat, so even though it's single coil, it doesn't have as much hum as the old single coils had. So Gibson, competing with Gretsch, comes up with a humbucker for guitars. So Nobla had done the one for piano but it takes a guy named Seth Lover, he has all the Fender stuff. Well, here's Gretsch's in the 1950s, filters out electronic hum. So they call it the Filtertron pickup. <laughs> Clever, huh? All these guys had great acronyms. There it is. Notice there's two coils going on, okay? And then we move to Seth Lover, great name, and he invents this patented pickup right here, a humbucker. It becomes known as the PAF. Why? Does anyone know this story? Why is it the PAF? There's got to be some guitar geeks out there. It's the patent applied for pickup. <laughs> I'm not kidding, not kidding. So, so Fender, uh, Gibson stamps on the pickups, patent applied for, because it wants to rush these out to market because they're competing with Gretsch. So they need to get these things out there. And... They stamp on it just like today. We would stamp on, you know, uh, uh, patent pending or something like that. They put patent applied for. People shorten that to PAF. And then when these comes out, these just blow everyone away because 
They're basically a warmer, fatter sound, and can, they can overdrive the amp even more. Okay, so I roll the volume down, and I'll do just as a demo to hear how you do it all from the guitar with just a tube circuit. You, I'll do this old uh, ZZ Top song and hear how it ranges from clean to distorted. And you can do all this double hand stuff. And now notice the compression part too. I can mute this way down. Let's do like a Neil Young song. So I can mute the crap out of it. Well, sorry, saying that. You, you have your palm on it, and it gets it down below the vocals. And then as soon as I want to blaze away, I'm doing this. And the vocals stop. That's not fun for you, but that's fun for me. <laughs> okay, so. I'm sorry, don't get me started. I'll just go on uh, uh, forever. Okay, so there's the patent for it. Notice I saw a nice hollow body guitar, not a solid body like this. And then, let me just wrap it up because I'm probably out of time. I got one minute, perfect. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's my conclusion. It's a funny story. These once futuristic pickups okay, are now vintage because we move forward and by the 80s and 90s we start making pickups that can make this sound like an acoustic and that's great but now you have two kinds of guitars, acoustic and electric and this sounds good for some things, this sounds good for other things. If we had developed those, it's PGO uh, technology is what does a lot of these kind of pickups, well if they're under the bridge, if we had developed that in the 30s and 40s we would not have had this. So often, happenstance of history, technology limits at the time, and most importantly, really creative inventors getting around problems, problems of microphones, acoustic boxes, can come up with just mind-blowing things. They're patents, but it's all about music. Now let me add one last fill-up to the story. PAF becomes a trademark, but not a trademark for Gibson. It's a trademark for the DiMarzio company. Who's the DiMarzio company? They make aftermarket pickups, and they make them in the 1980s in the PAF original style, and they say, hey, all you players, you've got newer Gibson pickups. You want that old sound? We've made one just like those old PAF pickups, and they get the trademark for it. All right, thank you. Right. Sorry you have to follow that. Um, <laughs> but... Our next speaker is Jackie Campbell, who is the director of and partnership marketing at Big Machine Label Group. So I don't know how I follow that, <laughs> um, but I have given away a lot of guitars because I'm the marketing person on the panel. Um, so wanted to talk about a couple things, marketing related and partnership related, but also wanted to kind of level set a little bit so you kind of understand the perspective that I'm coming from. Um, I'm with Big Machine Records, which is the number one um, independent record label group in the world. Um, so that is important for a couple reasons. Um, number one, we are independent. So when you hear a lot about music and um, everything that has to do with record labels, 
we are not necessarily the same as you know what they're talking about when you hear Universal or Sony or Warner Brothers. We kind of can do our own thing. We are distributed by Universal, so we can opt in and opt out of certain partnerships or certain contracts. But in general, we're now that we're established, very fortunate that we can make our own decisions in, in the world of music business. Um, however, we were at one point the underdogs. Big Machine is about 10 years old, and 10 years ago we started with a unknown songwriter named Taylor, Taylor Swift. And now we have over 35 artists on our roster, um, including Taylor, obviously, as one of the biggest superstars in all of music worldwide. Um, but also because of the independence that we have and just the creativity that our president and CEO Scott Borchetta has, all of our artist partnerships are very unique. So not only do we do a lot in the world of partnership marketing, but just our artist contracts and everything are unique. Taylor Swift, obviously a huge name, but we also have and are very proud to call Tim McGraw and Rascal Flatts and Hank Williams Jr. part of our roster because they've come to us after you know being on their own record deals for decades um, to, to form partnerships with us. We also have unique partnerships with American Idol and The Voice and, the sh and ABC TV for the show Nashville. So there's a lot of, of experience and partnerships we've created. I also want to take a quick second or a couple minutes of my time here to just tell everyone where the music industry really is. There's a lot of misperceptions when it comes to music. And the fact is that today more people that are consuming music than ever before. The revenue is about half of what it was uh, 10 years ago, but the fact is is that people love music more than ever and they're finding it in so many different places. And that's, it's our job now to kind of figure out the future and how do, how do all the rights holders with music continue to make money because obviously people want it. A couple of key, um, key things to, to know about this is that growth is coming from streaming services, not album sales. So while as a music industry we have been really trying to drive home that you have to buy the full album, that's just not the reality, even though we'll still continue to try to convince you to buy the full album. Digital downloads are dying. This is probably new information for some people if you don't live it every day like I do, but, um, but that is, that's already in the past. While we were fighting that for a long time, we've already moved on past that. Um, vinyl records, though, are huge. Who would have guessed that in the last year um, there's been a gain of over 51% in vinyl record sales, and that is um, a huge piece of, of a profitable piece of business in, in music right now. Um, they actually, you know, the, the folks that make vinyl records can't keep up with the orders. A lot of that is um, thankful to Urban Outfitters, who would have guessed. Um, brand partnerships in music are becoming a bigger and bigger part of the marketing mix, and that's why I was asked to speak here. Um, and I think really the future is transparency in, in the music business. What we've seen a lot of in the last year, and, and a lot of it was Taylor Swift that has been speaking out about who gets paid um, in all these different music services and downloads and, and everything that's happening. And what we've seen is the fans react to that. They love music and they want their artists and their favorite people out there to get paid. They just didn't know. They thought the money wasn't going to the creators of music. And when you're transparent about that, you see that's how the whole ecosystem actually works. So it's really an exciting time um, to be a part of the music business. I want to touch on streaming because that is such a big part of this right now. Um, it's, it's crazy to believe that, that people, that this is really the primary spot where people go for music right now. In, in 2014, year in data that you can see, um, paid subscriptions have grown tremendously. Now that's, when you talk about paid subscriptions, that's like Spotify paid service or Apple Music. Um, although this, obviously Apple Music is brand new, so this doesn't even include any stats on Apple Music, um, but overall, um, those stats have tripled since 2011. And just if you're looking at the first six months of 2015, streaming's gone from 27% of that pie of revenue to 32%. And physical, just continue, physical, which is album sales at retail, continue to decrease and um, downloads are becoming um, a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. And then when you talk about streaming, it's more complicated. You can't just talk about streaming. There's like three different main categories. There's paid subscriptions, which is the Spotify premium or the Apple Music. There's sound exchange distributions, which is Pandora, which is basically your kind of online radio. And then there's on-demand ad-supported, which is Spotify free. And that's what Taylor Swift and Scott Borchetta and Big Machine is not a huge fan of. Um, because as you see, when you look at the 
the, P, the different graphs here, on-demand ad-supported is the lowest amount of revenue. Luckily, it's also not growing as subscription is, and that's where all the rights holders get a bigger piece of revenue. Um, but either way, whether you're talking about streaming or downloads, digital overall is really taking over all of music sales. So that's where we kind of get into more of the partnership marketing side. A really exciting part about being part of Big Machine and anything that's really innovative in music right now. Um, you know, Scott, our CEO, has always been about get me that lane that nobody else is racing in and we're going to find a way to win in it. And he's really been doing that and Big Machine has been leading the charge, Taylor primarily, um, in, in really being transparent about music. Another area that we've been really innovative in since we launched Taylor and every artist after her is partnership marketing. And that's really what I oversee at Big Machine and I think is really important in the, in the music ecosystem right now. The reason that we think partnership marketing is so important is that, as I mentioned in the very beginning, revenue in music is, is just down. There's, it's, it's not what it used to be. If you look at the heyday of the 60s and 70s, record labels sold so many albums, they didn't care about anything else. They didn't care about touring. They didn't care about sponsorship endorsement revenue. They were just like, hey, everyone else can have that money. We're just rolling in the cash over here. That's not true anymore, and we don't have budgets to support the big ideas. But we still want to market an album, and you still want to do really big things. The other challenge is there's not one place to go to for, for marketing anymore. You can't just put a, a TV commercial on a major network and know that everyone's going to see it or put a poster in a record store. Everyone is seeing so many more messages and there's so many different ways to get to people. It's hard to stand out. By aligning with partners, you're really able to combine the best assets, whether it's events and media and retail, to, cut, to touch cut consumers in so many different ways. We really believe that when you combine things like music and events, and media, and even cause marketing is a big thing that we do a lot with, and these corporate partners, you're able to achieve this bigger win, something that you couldn't have achieved alone with just your standard budget for marketing. It gets complicated, though, because that's where we have to come up with these ideas, and music is, is not wholly owned by any one person, as I, as I believe Mark will speak after me about, you know, from the songwriting perspective, any one song has so many different rights holders. And to do anything to promote not only that song, but a whole album of work, there's a lot of people involved. And that's where I think we all just need to be more creative and more um, understanding of the world of partnerships. Another big motto at Big Machine that I love is start it crazy and work backwards. So that's always my instruction when we start partnerships. I have two examples that I'm going to go through really quickly, but we can, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. But um, Diet Coke is a big partner of ours through, through Taylor. There's sort of two different ways that we partner. One can be very artist specific, like this example, and my next example could be multi-artist. But Diet Coke, um, you know, Taylor's a big Diet Coke fan, and once you get to Taylor Swift status, if you're a fan of something, chances are you can create a, a great partnership. And she's had a very multi-year relationship with Diet Coke. When we released just her last album, 1989, we partnered with Diet Coke from a marketing perspective, and we were able to secure a mid-six-figure media budget in order to market the album. This is huge, because even someone like Taylor sees the value of partners in order to sell her album. We were able to work with iHeartMedia to completely take over every single pop radio station that was part of their network through this media campaign that was made possible from Diet Coke. So from contests to on-air mentions to social media um, to you know, a whole digital series and a live broadcast with Ryan Seacrest, there were so many different things we were able to do, again, all because Diet Coke came to the table as a partner on this um, huge launch of her last album. Another big campaign that we're really proud of is a campaign called Outnumber Hunger that was founded by General Mills, Big Machine, and Feeding America. This is something I certainly spend a lot of time on every year. Um, but from a cause marketing standpoint, it's a really something that all of our artists are proud to be a part of because we've secured over 35 million meals for Feeding America. But the bigger win that we see, well, I don't want to say bigger because the cause is first and foremost, but one of the reasons that we have partnered with General Mills is because of everything that they can come to the table with. This is an example of a Cheerios box that you would have seen at any grocery store last April. Um, and it featured all of our artists, well, not all of our artists, but a whole selection of artists. Reba 
worked with us to be the headline artist, and then we were able to feature, um, I think it's not 10 different artists on the back of the package. This, you know, it, it's the General Mills partnership actually features over 90 brands. So in the course of two months, these artists were featured on over 60,000 packages that were in every store from Albertsons to Kroger to Walmart to Target. Um, huge marketing play for us. In addition, there's all kinds of, in addition to the retail components, again, we leverage General Mills media relationships and our own media relationships and their media dollars to do all kinds of amazing things that we wouldn't have been able to do. We wrapped this around a launch of Reba's most recent record, and she did media and TV appearances. She was featured in USA Today, um, all kinds of different things. A TV special, we actually produced a TV special in partnership with Gannett um, TV stations, iHeartMedia, and CMT. And again, all made possible from Outnumber Hunger and not costing the artist or the record label one single dollar. So this is really the benefit of different partnership marketing and the reason that I think it's really important that all rights holders have to come together um, when it comes to marketing a project, because ultimately the idea is that the, that will sell more and make more money on, on the back end. There's all kinds of partnership opportunities. Um, we could talk about this all day. Um, this is sort of a little slide I put together on the different lanes that we go down um, for any type of partnership, um, from events and tour marketing that we're very involved in, music and retail integrations, like Targets and Walmarts are really important to us, radio promotion, digital, and of course, TV. And that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. All right, and finally we get to hear from Mark Beeson, who is a staff songwriter at Downtown Music Publishing. Well, I'm, uh, uh, I'm just going to sit here because I have nothing to show anybody. Um, I, uh, I'm probably the least formally educated person in this room, uh, but uh, there's all different ways that we've grown up and learned. And uh, uh, I thought um, in, in talking with Mark, he wanted me to be on here to give you some context of what a creator's life is like, um, somebody who creates copyrights and how I got started on that crazy journey. And uh, uh, I started, really, uh, I grew up in a little town in Illinois, and um, when I was 11, my mom gave me a really old, funky guitar. and. I sat in front of my record player and I would play 45s over and over again. Yes, I'm that old. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I wore those suckers out, you know, and would just sit on the edge of my bed and play over and over again and try and figure out what the notes were. And I'd figure one note and then I'd add a note and that was how I taught myself to play guitar. And because I played the records over and over, it just gradually I just kind of figured out a little bit of what the construction of a song was. And, uh, and so I started writing really horrible songs, you know? And uh, I mean, that's the, way, that's the way it works. You have to write a lot of really crummy songs before you ever write anything that's any good. Um, when I was in high school, uh, my family moved to New Mexico and, and I, when I was 16 and I started realizing that I thought that music was gonna be the thing that I wanted to do um, but it was, I was scared to do it because there was nobody to talk to about it. There was, I didn't know anybody who'd ever done it. And, uh, and uh, I just knew that there were people that I really gravitated to, like Jackson Brown and, and the Eagles and, and Poco and some of those Southern California country bands. And I, and I thought, well, they did something. They went somewhere to get as good as they got. And um, <clears throat> so after high school, I didn't go to college. I felt like what I needed to learn, I was going to have to learn in other ways. And so I started playing, um, working any kind of job I could get and, you know, playing any kind of, any kind of place I could play, you know, and sometimes for the hat, sometimes for tip jars. Um, sometimes I played for my supper, you know, and sometimes I slept in the back of my old uh, Pontiac station wagon. But, you know, when you're 18, it's just an adventure, it wasn't a hardship for me, it was part of this journey. And um, I started playing in bands, and uh, uh, I started realizing where in the food chain musicians were uh, when we, uh, we played a, a bar in Farmington, New Mexico. One time I was 19 or 20 years old, and we played 12 nights in a row 
from uh, eight to two every night. And um, the last night, we went to the to the uh, owner's office to get paid, and we went in there, and there was a couple of bouncers in there with him, and and he had a pistol laying on a desk, and he said, "I ain't paying you, boys." And there was nothing we could do about it. And uh, there's no better business bureau for musicians, you know, for people like that. And uh, that was kind of where I, I realized what an uphill battle it was going to be. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm just not going to do this, this kind of thing anymore. And when I was 23, I decided to move to Los Angeles because of that, you know, the artists that I, that I respected and followed all seemed to come from that area. And I, I went to L.A. And, uh, and I took my acoustic guitar because all those guys played acoustic guitar. And uh, I went out there, and it, it only took me about uh, 15 minutes to figure out that I had missed my acoustic guitar window out there. And it was all, this was back in the 80s, so it was all like spandex and <laughs> glam bands and stuff. So I'm carrying my acoustic guitar around. I might as well have had a tuba. Uh, I mean, and so, uh, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I know the third night I was there, I was staying in this really crummy motel on Sunset Boulevard, and I wandered down to a club down in the corner called the Whiskey A Go Go. And uh, there was a band playing in there, and they were really good, and they were trying to get a record deal. And, and uh, when the drummer came off, I was talking to him, and, and, it, and it was Van Halen. And it was before they got their record deal, and, and that was where it was all going. And that was way far away from what I was doing. So I spent 10 years, I'm a slow learner, uh, trying to figure that out. And, uh, but I did, I took a lot of meetings in uh, uh, trying to figure out what my direction was or what it was I was supposed to do, whether it was to sing or play or write. And I was kind of doing all of it. And, uh, and I would go into these meetings in LA and, and I would have my acoustic guitar and every time I would go in there, they go, man, you should go to Nashville. I could have been playing Led Zeppelin music, but I was playing an acoustic guitar, so they said, oh, you should go to Nashville. So eventually, the opportunity arose that I was able to go and, and visit for a week in, in 1989. And, uh, and it was an amazing experience because I'd never been anywhere where the culture of music was so incredibly deep, and I just felt it as soon as I, as I got there, the culture of songwriting and playing and singing. and and um, And so... We moved, and um, we had a little, we had a little house, and uh, and we sold that house, and and this was this was like the big commitment, and we, we thought, okay, we're gonna live on what we made from this house, as long as it lasts, like a year or whatever, so that all we do is is right, and and we're either gonna break through or we're not, you know, and uh, and it was a really great risk to take. Um, I went and I had I had some moments that were really seminal moments for me in that first year. One of them being the very first meeting I went to. I walked in, I played a couple of songs on my guitar, and the guy said, "You sound pretty pop. You ever thought about going to L.A.?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was like a like a, a a wake up moment. I thought, okay, I just have to do what I do and I have to be true to what I do because that's going to be the only thing that makes me unique is trying to follow what everybody else is doing was never going to be the answer for me or for anybody who wants to make a living in this. And, uh, and uh, I remember a couple of weeks later I went to the, uh, the Bluebird Cafe one night and uh, it was my first time in there and there were four writers playing, um, all of them big writers at the time. I didn't know who they were and I didn't recognize any of their songs but um, about halfway through the evening, I had what I, what I call my, you'll ex have to excuse my French, but I call it my holy shit moment, where I was sitting there and, and I thought, holy shit, I thought the bar was here, and it's really, it was really up here. And it was, it, was, it was a seminal moment for me because I realized I had so much work to do to get to the level of people who were actually making a living at it. And... Uh, I'm telling you all this so that you have some context into what the life of a, of a songwriter is like. Uh, there's no classes, there's no diplomas, there's no watermarks, there's only busting your butt, trying to dig deep every day and trying to write something that matters, trying to write something that's true. And uh, the only thing you control is what happens in the room that day when you're writing. 
and then after that, it's all out of your control. And uh, and so, uh, let me let me just say, I guess I should probably uh, tell you. Uh, Mark had said I should tell you all how it is I make a living, and uh, how we get paid, and. Uh, this will be an interesting context for the streaming conversation. Um, uh, we have two forms of royalties. We have mechanical royalties, <clears throat> which are like hard sales, physical sales, like CDs or records, that type of thing, downloads. Obviously not looking real good right now. And, uh, and then there's performance royalties, which would be radio or TV or movies, that type of thing. And um, uh, you know, the formula as, as it was for many years um, with physical sales, that, that accounted for about 50% of the income that you would make as a songwriter. And so if you were on a platinum record that sold a million CDs, if you wrote a song by yourself and you published the song yourself, that would be worth $60,000. Okay. Now, 99% of writers don't write it all by themselves and don't have 100% of the publishing. Usually there's a co-writer and a co-publisher and then, you know, so it would usually be a quarter of that. Um, but uh, a friend of mine like Tony Arada, Tony had, uh, had six, so six different songs on, on uh, Garth Brooks records back in the 90s. One of them was The Dance, which obviously was a huge record, uh, a, a radio record as well, but he made a considerable amount of money from um, having album cuts on Garth Brooks because we're talking about 15, 20 million units sold on an, on an artist, which is pretty amazing. Uh, now, uh, a million, that, that doesn't really play. There's, there isn't a million sales anymore. I mean, maybe, I think Taylor, I mean, in, 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 well, let's just put it this way. In 1996, there was 19 platinum acts in country music, and now there's two. And uh, so there's, you could see the obvious ways that the income stream has, has like, been cut in half, uh, like you were saying, in, in, in all of those ways. So the mechanical sales affected record companies as much as songwriters. Um, and now the new mechanicals are streaming and uh, now a million streams of Pandora, if you write that song, that whole song of yourself, by yourself, and you have the whole, all the publishing on that song, a million streams will pay you $90. And, okay, so here's the, here's the deal, and I'm just gonna give you my numbers because I'm not a legal mind, I can't sit here and, and argue anything other than, than real, um, real numbers, and I can tell you that the fourth, my fourth quarter ASCAP statement last year, I had, uh, I achieved a miracle. I had, I had a number one on an artist named Billy Carrington last year called We Are Tonight, and it was a big hit. And uh, my statement in July was that was from the fourth quarter last year. Uh, Pandora had six million plays, and I got one hundred and twenty dollars. Spotify was five million plays. I got $129. YouTube, I had 500,000 plays on YouTube, and I got $5. And when I think about that, I think about that club owner in Farmington. Only nobody's got a gun. And I, I and uh, uh, there's, there's, well, let's just put this way. There, there used to be, when I first came to town, there was about 15 or 1,600 professional songwriters in Nashville that were making some kind of living as a songwriter. And now there's probably about 250, maybe 300 of us left. And, and it's, a, it's an American art form that is dying. And, uh, and I don't know how to say it other than any other way than that. And I, I don't know how to quantify what I do any other way other than to say that um, I had a hit back in the 90s and, uh, called When She Cries, and it, and it was a pretty big hit. And a guy, a guy said to me, he said, man, you're going to make a lot of money for three minutes. And, and I got to thinking about it later. And, and the truth is, is, I was being paid for the thousands of hours and the hundreds of songs I wrote to get to that one. And just the same way that you all went to school 
and, and have practiced your profession for however long you've done it. That's exactly what I've done in a different way. And I don't think it's unfair to expect to be compensated for it. And I don't think there's any songwriter in Nashville who is greedy or wants, nobody, it's like we were talking about, nobody gets in the music business initially to get rich. Not on the creative side anyway. I got in it because I love it and, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm capable of extreme amounts of denial of reality. <laughs> And also, I don't need a lot, so I can I can I can handle the rea the uh, roller coaster. It, it's I can deal with that, and it's fine. Um, so I, I just I'll just end by saying that um, there's a uh, an organization in Nashville called the Nashville Songwriters Association, and um, and their motto is it all begins with a song, and and it's it's so incredibly true. Everything, the record companies. The publishers, radio, every venue, and even Pandora, they don't exist without songs. And uh, they're built on the back of a song. And, and I just glad I got a chance to tell you all about it. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, so we're going to have questions. I'm going to go ahead and, um, and ask one question just to get the ball rolling to try to um, start bringing back all of the really uh, you know, rich accounts we've just heard into the theme of the conference, which is, of course, the use of you know, the idea that intellectual property serves as a platform for this type of creativity. And, and one of the ideas that I want to inject into the conversation at this point is that, yes, it's true that intellectual property in one sense is a legal regime, but of course, part of the big problem that we seem to have right now is that on the internet, it's incredibly difficult to enforce as a legal regime. And so there's also the underlying question of to what extent is intellectual property a normative regime? In other words, uh, an idea that people have a, an innate sense of, of fairness, like it, what Mark was speaking to, or a sense that if people are giving me value in some sense, I ought to be able to, uh, I ought to be willing to compensate them for that. And I noticed that Jackie, I, I wanted to ask you specifically to, to, uh, this question because in your presentation, you talked at one point about this idea that uh, the transparency idea and the idea that fans seem to respond. I'm curious from your perspective as somebody who's out there, you know, trying to market the stuff and trying to sell the stuff, to what sense do you, to what extent do you get a sense that the fan base that their attitude is, is it, you know, because for a while the attitude has been, oh well, music should be free, artists should tour, or whatever, or they're not even really thinking about it that much. It seems like there's been some pushback to try to educate the fan base about, you know, the kinds of things that Mark was talking about. I'm just curious, from your perspective, what was this transparency thing you were talking about, and can you flesh that out a little bit more? What's the fans? Uh... Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's, you know, some cold, hard research yet on it, but I think what we've seen in just the streaming argument is that the more information that comes out there and is communicated on a more public basis, it seems like the fans are responding. I think that's a little bit of what's happened with the success of paid um, subscription streaming. Um, I think it's really been communicated out there that that is the artist's preferred model. I mean, obviously, the preferred model is go back and buy albums, but I think we all have to kind of move into the digital age, and right now, that is the best solution not that it's the best ever, seems to be the paid subscription model on streaming. Um, and I think now that fans are starting to understand that, they are starting to go that way. Um, and they, there's been such an increase there. And they feel that they're giving the artists what they need. I don't think they completely understand it yet, and that's still not the solution. Um, but by paying that $9.99 a month, they think they're paying for music. And it's, a, it's also a value for them at $9.99 a month to be able to access such a large catalog of music. Obviously, it doesn't have every um, artist on there yet. Spotify doesn't have Taylor Swift. But um, you know, it is a great value for the fans. And I think that's sort of shifting their perception, where you know, when I was in college, Napster was the big thing, and everyone was stealing music. And then iTunes came along and provided a solution by providing 99 cent songs. And eventually, people moved into that model, and downloads were the most popular. And now, then streaming came, and it's even more of a value. So I think transparency yeah, yeah. is really helping the fans understand the model and understanding by, by someone like Taylor speaking out. She's not speaking out on herself. Um, she, she will say that she's, she's good, but it's all the people that go into the work of making an album like hers or anyone else's 
that they need to get compensated and they don't get compensated on her tour. They get compensated when you buy her music and when you buy any artist that you love's music. So I think by the artist communicating that more to fans, it se there seems to be some, re some positive reaction to that. Thanks, I'm gonna just ask one quick question to Mark and then I'll open it up to the floor, which is, Obviously, you've been in this biz for, for quite a while, and you've described the state of affairs as it is now, and you talked a little bit about the way in which you know, the number of professional songwriters has been dwindling um, recently. Um, and you, you see, you hear a lot of research with people saying things like, well, copyright is basically just a lottery system where you get a, a hand, tiny handful of people like Taylor who make it big and make millions, and then nobody else really makes any money from copyright. Now, a couple, it may be that that's getting more like that now because of what's happening in the economy, but I'm wondering what... What, what was it like from your perspective earlier on? You've seen an evolution, and was it ever the case that you had a, a stratum of songwriters who maybe they weren't the superstars making the biggest bucks, but they were able to make a decent living, or at least a supplemental living, or what did that look like? What did that value proposition look like as a songwriter you know, earlier on, and you know, to what extent has that changed? Well, I think, um, boy, that's such a big question. Um, you know, there's... Uh, it, like I, I go back to the '90s because it was a heyday for the for the record business. Um, you could conceivably, I think anybody, uh, I mean, for songwriters, um, you can have individual copyrights that are really valuable, but the the real value is having a catalog. And if you can sprinkle, if you have if you have several copyrights in a catalog that are really valuable, it increases the inv the whole value of a catalog and. And a copyright to a songwriter is, I mean, that's, that's my real estate. I mean, that's my land. And uh, you could conceivably, now, this is a complicated explanation, but most professional songwriters have a publisher, okay? And when you have a publisher, you have signed, you, in exchange for them pitching your songs, for giving you some kind of a living advance, not a big one, but some kind of living advance so that you can just write and paying for your demos and that type of stuff. In exchange for that, you give them the publishing to the song. And if you're an established writer, if you've had a track record, you could get a co-publishing agreement, meaning that once you recoup whatever they've given you, then you can participate in the copyright. The problem nowadays is, back in the 90s, when there was mechanical sales, when there was something, you know, if somebody, I mean, Tony, Tony, re, Tony, I'm sure, recouped all of his catalog just from one Garth Brooks cut. It didn't even have to be a radio hit because it sold enough, it sold enough product that he could recoup his advance. Now, and, that, and, and uh, mechanicals is where a publisher recoups an advance. And I can tell you, those numbers I gave you for We Are Tonight, I am never going to recoup my catalog and be able to participate in the copyright of the song that I wrote that went number one because the streaming services won't pay enough for me to ever be able to recoup my advances. So that's how it's changed. And, uh, and, and, and so along with that, our publishers have less money to spend. They're not signing writers. They can't afford to. There's no, there's no money in it. And only somebody who is writing hits that are actually gonna generate enough radio revenue, uh, which is the only way that songwriters and publishers make money anymore, is, uh, is radio airplay. Uh, if you can't generate that, then just having album cuts doesn't work anymore. I mean, I have a song on Garth Brooks' record that he has out now. I have a song on Lady Annabellum's record right now. But neither one of them are gonna be singles. And I may make a couple thousand dollars from, from having cuts on major records. All right, I'm gonna open it up for some questions from the audience, yes? Has anybody got any Jack Daniels? <laughs> it's time to start drinking. <laughs> Steve, if you could just wait for the microphone. Uh, yeah. So first, let me, let me, let me uh, say how, how great I thought this panel was and what a great way it was to start uh, the conference. And, and in particular to uh, uh, thank uh, Mark and Sean uh, for uh, their, uh, you know, uh, a performance and also a sort of a performance of what it's like to actually make a living as a songwriter. Um, 
my question sort of sort of moves from from, uh, from there, sort of builds on something Chris said, which is, in both of your stories, there's a, there's a story here about the role of intellectual property in creating art. And in uh, uh, Sean's story, the, the story about intellectual property is the pickups. Um, now, let's say I'm somebody who's not a, a you know, I'm your typical uh, person who's not a fan of IP. There's a lot of them out in the world. Uh, and I would make the following argument, and, I, and I'd like to hear your, both of you respond to it. Well, the pickups would have happened even without the patents. People just wanted to uh, break through a technological barrier, and even had they not been able to patent it and, and appropriate uh, returns from that uh, holding a, uh, uh, um, uh, a use right to, uh, to, to the pickup, or property right to the pickup, the pickups would have happened, the music would have evolved exactly the same. The patent system had nothing to do with it. And I, I put the same question to Mark, which is, okay, um, you went into this because you wanted to make music, and other songwriters go into it uh, because you want to make music. And um, the fact that uh, there is a copyright system um, doesn't appear to be benefiting songwriters. So why do we uh, have copyright? Uh, that is, if I was a sort of strong anti-IP person, I would say, see, this is, both of these stories are examples of why we don't need intellectual property. So I, I'd like to get your, get your thoughts on that. Sure. So uh, first off, I was remiss in not thanking Devlin and Matt, because these are not my guitars. They were kind enough to lend me their stuff. So it's uh, Devlin's Strat and, and Amplifier and Matt's uh, Les Paul and Devlin's Acoustic too. So thank you guys for that. Okay, so I actually have a fairly easy answer to your question, and it's that it's the professional nature of producing the pickups that can be on these kinds of mass-produced but in a good way guitars that are why we needed IP and why music was able to evolve the way it does. So let me say this differently. Has anyone, and I've done this with my kids, has anyone tried to build a little... Uh, you know, basic radio circuit to show your kids how basic stuff works, and you, and you try to wrap the coil around like the paper towel roll or the toilet paper roll. Nobody knows what, some people know what I'm talking about, right? So I grew up on those Radio Shack circuits, now it's Arduino, but if you try to wrap the coil by yourself, it sucks, right? It doesn't work very well because you can't get it tight enough, you can't do it too well. So Bouchamp, the guy I first told you about who gets the first patent on one, what that patent is doing and why they need the IP is to give them the space so they can actually develop a bunch of manufacturing know-how. So they build their own coil wrapping machines first out of a um, washing machine that's going around. So they use other things. So if they weren't able to capture the returns on that, they would not have been able to invest the time and resources to make professional versions. So you have guys running around with really bad pickups. Yes, they could have made them themselves, but it wouldn't have been this reliable and this good. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I kind of got what you're saying. I, 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 think, I think it's not, I don't think it's a copyright question. I think it's a delivery question. And, and I don't think it has anything, I don't think it's the consumer's responsibility, the fact that uh, in this particular case especially, I mean, I, am, I totally embrace uh, the new technology, even though I'm, like Fred Flintstone when it comes to it. I, I really embrace it because I feel like tons of kids are getting to listen to music and getting influenced and, and having chances to make music and be heard that would never ever be heard and on, and on a local basis or whatever. And they don't have to go to Los Angeles or Nashville or New York or someplace like that to do it. And, 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 for the, and it doesn't even have to be about getting rich. I don't think that's the deal. I mean, I... I uh, I mean, I, I just want to make enough money to keep doing what I'm doing. That's all I care about. I never cared about being rich. And, and uh, I think that the streaming services, I mean, Pandora is taking advantage of, a, of an antiquated consent decree, which doesn't allow songwriters and publishers to negotiate fair market value for the songs. And uh, record companies and artists don't have a consent decree problem. And so... They have, uh, so like Pandora has to, it pays 44, 42, 42% of what they make to record companies and artists. 
because they have to negotiate that fee. They pay 4% to all the songwriters and publishers. That's it. And then they keep 54%. So, I mean, that's just a messed up equation. I mean, it's just not a, a fair... It, I mean, on any, on any level, I don't think it, it's about copyright. It's about if, you're, if your business is based on a song, don't you think you should have to pay for the product that you're se turning around and selling? That's, that's, the, that's the issue for me. It has nothing to do with the consumer. It's not their responsibility. But I, 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 do, think that it, it, I do think that it's not unfair to want to be fairly compensated for the work that you do. And if I could just jump, jump in on this too, I think this, this goes back to the point I made that copyright and, and property rights in general only have value if they're actually enforced and if they're not watered down. And so to, to look at the current state of the music, the uh, music industry, especially with respect to songwriters, and say, here's evidence of why we don't need copyright because it doesn't work anyway, well, that's ignoring the fact that we have a lot of flaws in our system that need to be addressed. And you know, uh, Mark talked about the excessive compulsory licenses that really bring down rates for songwriters. And there's also an enforcement problem. And just like with any other property, right, if, if, if you're not enforcing it, and if you're watering it down, you're not going to get the benefits of, a, of, of the right itself. Could I add a follow up on this? Because this issue is, this is what I'm just, I'm I think we're good. Just wait for the microphone. Like microphone. Could I follow on some Because there is this, there's a adjoining issue in patenting about compulsory licensing. Could you say some words about how compulsory licensing developed in the music industry and why compulsory licenses? mean that the person who owns the IP, that is the songwriter and the publisher, winds up getting very little from a compulsory license? I'm going to pass that yeah. off to Sean. Yeah, so it was in the very early uh, 20th century, and the concern, as they were doing the 1909 Copyright Act, was that um, people could, a publisher could sign all of the songwriters and have one mega you know, uh, group, you know, stable of songwriters, and then essentially create a monopoly around it. So the idea was, even if they tried to do that, but if there was compulsory licenses, especially from the mechanical, then that would prevent that from being as onerous as it might be. So it was really sort of a historical artifact. There was some concern about somebody tying up all the songwriters. And, and I think technological innovation and the kind of transparency that Jackie's talking about really alleviates that concern to the point where it's hard to look at today's system and justify why we have the regime that we do. And we have another question. A most excellent panel. I'm thinking now about piracy. You just alluded to this, uh, Matthew. Uh, we participate in a trade show involving uh, music products companies, and we often have many visitors to the trade show. And they come to the booth and they say, I am a musician, I am a performer or songwriter. Uh, well, wait a minute, I, I should say I was a musician. My career is largely over because of piracy. And you, U.S. government, are doing nothing about that. You've ruined my life. How true is this? I don't take it personally, but, but I am very concerned about piracy, and it's a runaway problem, and I think it's getting worse. And I don't know what the answers should be, and I feel terrible, and I never know what to say on a personal level, but from a government perspective, or from a private company's perspective, or from a musician's perspective, performer, songwriter, what should we be doing? I think it's a huge problem. I don't know how huge. I think it's getting worse. I could be wrong. But I have no idea what we should be doing or could be doing. Well, I, first off, I, I don't think it's true that the government is, is doing nothing about piracy. Uh, and, 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 and the question is, how, how much can they do, and, and what, what's the appropriate solution, and what group of actors need to get together to solve the problem? And one of the things that you see is that there, you know, there, there has been a, a pretty big effort from, from companies and organizations that have a, have a stake in the issue to try to make it really hard to enforce copyrights. And, and, and a great example of that is is look at the DMCA notice and takedown system. We have a law that was passed in, in 1998 
when the idea was that if, if you found that somebody posted your song on the internet or your copyright, copyrighted work on the internet, you could, you could really quickly get in there and have it taken down before, before it spread, before it got out there. And, and those are the kind of issues that the, that the Congress was thinking about in 98 when they passed, when, when they passed the law. And in, in exchange for the takedown process, the, the, the various organizations, the, the ISPs and others that, that essentially hold together the infrastructure that makes content available on the internet were granted a whole bunch of safe harbors from, from, uh, from being sued for having you know, stolen content on their sites. And almost 20 years later, we're operating under the same framework and what happens in practice is you see your song, you know, say it's on Groove Shark, and I mean, maybe Groove Shark's not a great example, but you see it on a website now and you send the takedown notice to have it taken down and literally within a second, it's back up, but the, 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 the web company that's hosting that, the ISP that's providing the infrastructure, because of the law, they're shielded from liability for it. And, and so I think one of the issues is we, we need to update our statutes to really reflect the world that we live in today. And, and what's crazy is that back in the late 90s, the Congress understood that if you look at the legislative history of, 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 of the various revisions to copyright law that happened then, you'll see that the House Judiciary Committee and, and others were, were actively contemplating this is a field where technology is changing things a lot and we're gonna have to keep up with it and we're gonna have to pass you know, laws to update what's happening. And 20 years later, we're essentially stuck with the same laws as, as respect to, uh, to, to piracy enforcement. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you can say that the government's not doing a bad job now. We, ne we need a new legal regime. And there's also a lot of space for, for, for voluntary agreements between people and industry. There's been a great effort recently for, for advertisers to work together to, to keep their ads off of websites that host a lot of stolen content. And I think, I think voluntary arrangements are, are, are going to be key in the future, but there are, we also need to be realistic about the kinds of laws that we're operating under and, and how much can really be done. So, I mean, I would just add, I think, all the, the panelists, and Chris is moderator too, were talking about norms as well. And I just want to, so, you know, I agree with Matt about the statutory changes, but also um, getting people to understand, so having more stories, having Jackie and Mark getting out there and telling the story, getting people to understand what I'll call the value chain. I'm, I'm mainly focused on commercialization law. And so it's about getting people to understand that it's not just the final product, it's not just Taylor Swift, it's the songwriters, not to diminish her, but it's the songwriters, the producers, everything behind that, but that's largely hidden to the audience, especially the casual audience. How do you get them to see what goes into that and how those people get paid. And so if you want that kind of final product, just like if you want the professionally wound pickups, you got to give people a space so they can appropriate, so they can invest the time and the resources to make that fancy, commercialized, polished final product. And you've got to get people to understand that more. Yeah, and I think, I, I think along those lines, it's you know, something I always think back to is 20 years ago, I, I, was, I was a kid and I would spend probably 100 bucks a month on music because I love music. And now for 10 bucks a month, you get access to the entire world's catalog of music. And, and as, as, as Jackie was saying, music consumption is more popular than ever. People clearly like it. And there's this disconnect between the value that people have in, in having access to music, but then how much they're actually willing to pull out of their pockets to pay for it. And I think I think what Sean was talking about, having, having social norms and having people understand that there's a lot of work that goes into it can help with you know, getting people to open up their wallets and pay more for their, for their access to all the music in the world. I mean, I, I would happily pay 10 times what Spotify charges, and I don't understand how, how the fees for access to, this, to these kinds of catalogs can possibly be so low. I think, too, just to kind of add on to that, I think we all need to be focused on you know, being flexible in these spaces and then also focusing on the future. I think going back to piracy, a huge problem was that instead of figuring out, okay, how do we deal with this? This is the future. Record labels sued the fans. And so I think we're now just recovering from that because that made the fans really angry and they didn't understand why instead of, and that, that didn't make them buy full albums. So I think it's about, you know, really thinking about what's next in technology and music and having everyone involved in that creative and musical process to be a part of that. Um, and then it kind of goes back to also being flexible. Like an issue with Spotify is that 
you know, in, in our issue with it in regards to our superstar acts is that they don't allow, you have to be on the free service and the paid subscription service. Why not be flexible and say, okay, Taylor's at the level that she's not on our free service, but she's on our paid service, and that's an incentive to pay. Or maybe there's even an above premium service that's 20 bucks a month, and you get that much more access to exclusive content, and they're not doing that, which it'd be complicated to do that, but there are ways around this, and I think everyone kind of needs to contribute to how to solve the problem. Is your label doing any, taking any sorts of initiatives to try to uh, find alternative streaming companies that might be willing to do deals like that, that you could, I mean, because do you have an answer to Matt's question? Because Matt was just asking, well, I can't understand why the fees are so low. You're, are you, I mean, are you involved in actually negotiating with the Spotify's and the Pandora's of the world? And, I mean, not me personally, but, right. but absolutely. And it's kind of, they're the ones holding, you know, firm on certain things. I think a perfect example is what happened with Apple Music when they launched. And Taylor and a number of artists came out and said, because what they said was, this is a premium service. It will be $9.99 a month. But for the first three months, it is free for you to try it. And as part of that, they weren't going to pay anybody. Um, and so Taylor and other superstar artists stood up and said, well, then we're not going to be a part of this service. Why, if you want to give fans that three-month trial service, go ahead, but that shouldn't come out of our paychecks. That's your marketing, your platform. And when, that, when everyone spoke up, they changed that. And even though they still are giving three months free, everyone's getting paid like they would any other month. Not that that's the right payment model, going back to other complications, but I think it is about you know being vocal and having more people in the music business that have a voice stand up for those that don't. And, and, and it goes back to the question that was asked. You know, it, it's important to keep in mind that ultimately Spotify and Apple Music, they're competing against the black market. And as long as you know, it only takes two clicks of a mouse to get to free content, that, that's going to put downward pressure on how much people are willing to pay for paid content. So there's two. Oh, go ahead. The first, the first voice that spoke out on that Apple thing was Taylor. I mean, she was really the one. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Apple feels like they're so powerful that they could just make a plan to just not pay for three months and it would just be okay and everybody would just go, oh yeah, okay, whatever you say. And the truth is, is they do wield a lot of power and they can, they can bury your profile online uh, or they can put you up front. And, and I just felt like it was pretty amazing that out of the entire record business with all the big badasses like Springsteen and all these guys, it was a little blonde 20-something year old that stood up and she was the voice for the whole music business and she's the one who stopped it. And uh, uh, I don't know, I think it's... I think the important thing is that too, it's not just that she said, I'm not going to do this. She explained it. I mean, she, did. she really, and she is so, I mean, it's all her. We can't take any credit for it. But I mean, if you look at what she wrote on, you know, her Tumblr site, when she said, you know, an open letter to Apple, it wasn't just, I'm not going to do this. It was exactly why. And it's, and it's, she's very candid that it's not about her and she's like she'll say to everyone she's she's good but it's about the creative process and making sure that everyone's paid fairly and it was on social media mm -hmm. so it went exactly to the channels yes. that the most people yes. are on most people who could say who are apple's customers too and say well wait this doesn't seem right and that's how apple responded to her too yeah. i see any other hands up Getting your microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of a softball, but it occurs to me that we have uh, a gentleman uh, in the middle who says, I don't have much education uh, formally, but I spent a lot of time learning to do what I do. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, brain power sitting to the left and the right of him who are theoretically supposed to... I didn't to say I didn't have any brain power. I just <laughs> said it wasn't real educated. <laughs> I, I didn't say you didn't have any. I said there's brain power to the left and the right of you. I'm just who teasing. Are, who are supposed to be protecting, at least as I understand it, your interests. And there seems to be a disconnect uh, because you're not getting the benefit of what the other people are trying to get you. And, and my question is, what should we be doing to help you? I, I don't, honestly, I feel like 
I don't blame record companies. I think that they're taking advantage of what they can do, what they can do. They're not encumbered by a consent decree and more power to them. They should be able to get everything that they can get from a, from the services that are that are using their product to make money off of. And so I don't resent that, and I don't consider them to be responsible for the fact that uh, I, I talk about Pandora. I, I don't. I don't hold anybody responsible for that other than Pandora. And until the law changes or there's some kind of changes in how it's, 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 uh, it's seen, it, that's, that's the only thing that's gonna, that's gonna make a difference. But I will say that there are people in Congress and, and the Senate that are, that are really aware of it and trying, really trying to, uh, to do something about it. There's something called the Songwriter Equity Act that was introduced uh, that that uh, Lamar Alexander and Bob Corker from from Tennessee. I don't necessarily agree with their politics, but I love those guys because they're really very strongly uh, behind the idea of making making some kind of changes in the rate court or whatever, or how that, those fees are determined. So that's the way it's going to have to change. Do you want to speak up on behalf of the? Um, <laughs> Of the, the brain power that's not doing its job? <laughs> uh, well, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I should be holder of the brain trust. Uh, uh, anyway, um, you know, there are some statutory things we could do. I mean, I testified in Congress, you know, I was pushing the notice and stay down ways of making sure that when it just is the same file reposted immediately, that maybe we make an obligation on the website that they do have to take that down or have to keep it from being reposted and also tightening up the, the red flag notice, right? That, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that it's essentially you totally know of the, the actual infringement. Instead, if you're seeing the patterns, that we should tighten that up. The other thing I think, and I can't speak to it so much, but I know, where did I see Eric Priest is in the audience over there? He's got some really interesting work on looking at alternate ways of, of applying pressure, almost like soft pressure. And Eric, I'm gonna horribly mangle your, your thesis here, but it is just the idea that, so for example, in China, when there were um, a bunch of the, um, their homegrown kind of search companies, and they were driving too much, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, traffic towards pirated music and, and other kinds of content, that when, if you went to the advertisers and put pressure on the big multinational corporations who were advertisers on those sites, and they said, well, wait, we don't want to be affiliated with a pirate site, that that could then, and did in fact exert some pressure. So I should probably just say, Eric, do you want to say something about that? I just think it's a great idea, and we have to be thinking about these alternative ways around it, because it's not all just going to be about technological or straight on uh, uh, copyright enforcement. Mm -hmm. Can I do that? Can I send the mic up to Eric? Okay. Okay, well. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean. Uh, I wasn't expecting to talk about this. Sorry about tomorrow, that when you but, have a spot. Uh, 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 yeah, so I mean, that's, that's basically right. In, in China, there, um, so 10 years ago, the YouTube clones of China were notorious copyright infringers, not surprising, right? Because it's the internet and it's China. And, um, and so that you could get access to basically everything, both Chinese content regional content, Korean content, Taiwanese content, Japanese content, and Hollywood content on these sites. They weren't paying anybody anything, and yet they had advertising from the big major transnational you know, companies, the Coca-Colas, the Pepsis, the um, McDonald's, et cetera. Um, and so uh, the, the copyright owners, after trying to use you know, traditional legal enforcement mechanisms for for many years against these sites, um, uh, uh, did something very smart. They said, well, what's their lifeline? Their lifeline is these advertisers. Um, and so they went to the advertisers who happened to be big intellectual property owners themselves and sort of understood what it means to have your intellectual property um, being relatively unenforceable in, in a market like China. Um, and, uh, and they put pressure on those advertisers and the advertisers responded and they pulled, their con uh, they pulled their ads in many cases and threatened the websites and said, we're not gonna work with you anymore. And it worked uh, unbelievably well. So in fact, within you know, a matter of months, you couldn't find pirated content anymore on the major websites and they turned around and uh, licensed um, for 
way above market rates, which were very low at the time, because when you're competing with piracy, you don't, you know, even when somebody offers to, to pay licensing fees, they don't have to pay very much, because the value of the content is so low when there's widespread piracy. Um, but the licensing, licensing fees increased by 180-fold over two years for the most popular content, so something that cost, you know, $1,500 per episode in 2009, by 2011, you'd have to pay about $300,000 per episode to license the same content. It was a huge windfall for copyright owners. And this is in China. It actually, you know, this isn't, you know, the US or Sweden or something. This is China. Um, and so, you know, it's an example of how, um, how this, this kind of, you know, not just thinking about legal enforcement, but other outside the box um, kinds of market pressure based enforcements um, really, you know, can can be effective, and there there are certain reasons as well why it worked especially well in that context, and it doesn't wouldn't necessarily be transferable to to everything, but it's a good example of thinking outside um, outside the box. Yeah, so putting everyone on the spot. So I'm not going to look at Jackie because she's going to hate me for probably saying this out loud. But so as people like Taylor are doing these big deals with Diet Coke. Maybe it's a, this is, you know, it's part of the negotiation back and forth. One thing is, and Coke agrees not to advertise on pirate sites. Well, thanks. We're, we're I, don't gonna, I don't want to screw up any things, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're out of time for this panel. So uh, I guess we have a, about a 15-minute break until the next one. And uh, thanks for listening.